Good Shabbos, ladies and gentlemen. Good Shabbos. All right, so it's Parashat Kedoshim, and Kedoshim, of course, is the word Kadosh. Kadosh means holy, and holy means to be set apart. So Kadoshim is the holy ones, and this week's parasha is absolutely jam-packed, chock-a-block with commandments. There are 51 commandments, 51 mitzvot, just in this week's parasha. And it's a small parasha, right? Because usually, you know, in uh, normal years, we read Acharei, Mot, and Kedoshim together. This year, it's a leap year, so we read it separately. 51 of the commandments, over 8% of the entire Torah's commandments of all 613 are in this week's parasha. And these commandments read about in parasha Kedoshim are all derived from these 10 that are up here on these two tablets, which we stole from Moses. Right? The Ten Commandments are all subdivided into this week's parasha and all the commandments of Parashat Kedoshim. Now, you do know that there are two types of commandments. There are positive commandments and there are negative commandments. So, out of these 51 commandments, 13 are positive and 38 are negative. We have three times as many negative commandments in this week's parasha. Negative commandment is thou shalt not, thou shalt not, right? Positive is thou shalt. So we have three times as many negative commandments in this week's parasha. Now, there's a famous joke. It might be a story, it might be a joke. that says, when Moses came down Mount Sinai, of course, he saw us building the golden calf, and he smashed those tablets, right? What were the tablets made of? What material? Oh. Sapphire. They were sapphire tablets, and sapphire is a very expensive gem. So the joke goes that when, we, when he smashed those tablets, all the nations of the world came and saw the pieces and the fragments of the sapphire lying on the ground, and they each took for themselves. But the problem was, it was the Ten Commandments on there. So each piece that they took had a word inscribed in it. So one nation took for themselves a piece of sapphire that said, steal. <laughs> and they became a bunch of Tutsis. Another nation came and took the sapphire stone that said adultery, and they went and became, I don't know, probably the Greeks... Another one came and took another one that said murder, and I don't know, probably the Palestinians. Uh, they, didn't ex they didn't exist back then. Joke's on you. All right, anyway, so each nation came and took for themselves a piece of the Ten Commandments, and it had a different word on it. And when the Jews finally woke up and said, hey, maybe we should be taking for ourselves as well. It belonged to us in the first place. What, did they, what were they left with? All the pieces that said, don't, 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 don't. That's why there are so, negative, so many negative commandments in the Torah for us Jews. Everything is that thou shalt not. Everything seems to be a prohibition in Judaism. Right, so it's in these commandments in this week's parasha. These 51 commandments teaches us a lesson. The fact that the parasha is called Kedoshim, Hashem says you shall be made holy, teaches us that it's through the commandments, by keeping the word of Hashem and the commandments of Hashem, that we become holy. That's how we become holy. So there's a ton of stuff that gets um, forbidden for us in this week's parasha. Sorry, my mom's going to tune me or my wife's going to tune me. Sydney, you look so untidy. Uh, anyway, figure it out later. So there are so many commandments that tell us we are forbidden. What are some of the stuff that's forbidden in this week's parasha? We're forbidden from mixing clothing. So I'm trying to figure this out. Stripes and stars, etc., etc. Et we're not allowed to mix wool and linen in our clothes. That's one of the commandments. We're not allowed to mix seed while we're planting seed in our farms. You have to stick with one type of seed in each bedding. You're not allowed to mix them, which is quite strange, actually. I mean, nowadays there's people saying, suggesting that if you plant two types of seeds together, they actually help the soil and they help each other. But Hashem says, no, by divine decree, you're not even allowed to do that. Uh, there's a commandment that we are forbidden from theft, from stealing anything. Uh, we're forbidden from gossip in this week's parasha. It actually says that you shall not be a gossip monger in this week's parasha. And then there's a very prominent one. It says, you shall not place a stumbling block before the blind. What does that mean? Our rabbis say it doesn't mean literally what it means. And not placing a stumbling block before the blind. That's obvious. You should learn that in preschool. You should learn that at home by your parents. It's not on the level of mitzvah. It's a more deeper meaning. The blind over here is not someone who's physically blind. The blind that it's talking about here is someone who is spiritually blind. You need to be careful that you don't cause others around you to end up committing sins. So the way that you live your life needs to be in such a way that others don't look at you and say, Oh, that guy said doing it, so it must be fine. You have to physically, your appearance to others, your name, your, uh, your, uh, your reputation needs to precede you as well as someone who doesn't break the commandments. That's what it means to not put a stumbling block before the blind. Uh, furthermore, we've got a bunch of laws in this week's parasha about sexual immorality as well. Who you're allowed to marry and who you're not allowed to marry. You're not allowed to keep it in the family, says this week's parasha. There's a lot of forbidden union stuff in this week's parasha. It almost seems as if this parasha was written. For well, those Corinthians, because you know the Corinthians did all these types of things. All right, so I have a question for you now that we know about all these commandments. Can someone who is an unholy type of person keep 
all the commandments in this week's parasha and still remain an unholy type of person? Didn't we just say these commandments are what make you holy? They make you set apart? Can an unholy type of person keep these commandments but still stay an unholy type of person? Because think about this. Some people do the commandments. They do the mitzvot with the wrong intentions. The Perkei Avot, we said to you last week and we studied it. It said, you shall not make a worldly use of the crown of the Torah for yourself. If you do that with the Torah, it will lead to death. Right? We spoke about that last week. That uh, How can a rabbi say that? You know, when Paul goes and says it, Paul talks about the, 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 the law that leads to death. And people have an issue with Paul saying that. Well, our rabbi said the exact same thing in the Perkei Avot. If you use the Torah for worldly use, as a worldly occupation, it will lead to death. There's the Torah of uh, the, the, the law of sin of death, right? So what's going on here? Can people do the Torah and it causes them to die? Paul calls it legalism. He says legalism is the Torah that leads to death. Some people do the mitzvot only for the reward. They don't do it for the sake of heaven. Or they don't do it for its own sake. Only because they want something and they say, God, I'm going to bribe you. You made this law. I'm going to keep it and you have to reward me no matter what. That's how some people treat God. They treat him like a genie as well. And it happens a lot more often than we would like to admit. Okay. So, I want to share with you today an opinion by the Ramban, Nachmanides. Right? You're all familiar with that name, Nachmanides, Ramban. He has a famous drush on this week's parasha, on the opening words of the parasha, where uh, Kharach just read for us there. It says, Kiddushim ti you, it shall be holy unto you. What does it mean? Ramban comes along and he disagrees with Rashi. One of his favorite pastimes is to disagree with Rashi. Because Rashi's interpretation of Kiddushim and what it means to be holy is if you abstain from all of these horrible sensual relationships we read about in last week's parasha and this week's parasha, by abstaining from forbidden things, that's what makes you holy. Just keeping the all the uh, thou shalt not, that's what makes a person holy. Ramban comes along and says, no, no, no. It goes further than this. Don't focus only on the forbidden things. But look at the way you do permitted things as well. Ramban says, you shall sanctify yourself by that which is permitted. He points out a very important concept that Paul also points out for us. There's something known as the letter of the law. The text that says, you shall not do this. But there's also something known as the spirit of the law. And Paul says, the letter brings death, but the spirit brings life. So just doing the commandments for the sake of doing the commandments, that's the letter of the law. Yes, you're required to do that and do that. But there is something more. Ramban says, look into the things that are permitted for you. And the way that you behave in permitted things, there you should also sanctify yourself as holy. The way you do holy things also matters. Because, he says, even within all the commandments of the Torah, you can still be a degenerate who keeps the commandments. You can become a disgrace with the permission of the Torah, he says. For example, all right, there's a lot of kosher laws. You should not eat this, this, and this. You're allowed to eat this, this, and this. But even the way that you eat things that are kosher, you can still become a glutton. You can become gluttonous even with kosher food. Okay? Furthermore, marital relations. Okay, fine. You married your wife. Now you have a spouse. You haven't done anything outside of your marriage. But the things that you do in that relationship can also still be unacceptable practices in the bedroom. They are forbidden by the Torah. Even though it's in a, a kosher marital relationship between you and your spouse. Be careful of that. One famous one, polygamy. Does the Torah forbid polygamy? No. The Torah never forbids polygamy, right? Good or bad thing for you? We're going to read this afternoon in the Perkei Avot chapter 2. One of our sages tells us, the more wives, the more witchcraft. Right? Just ask Jacob Zuma. Go to his uh, parking garage. He doesn't have cars there. He's got brooms parked there next to each other. Okay. The more wives, the more witchcraft. We're going to discuss that a little bit more this afternoon if you guys stick around for our Perkei Avot class as well. So what is this? Where does he get this idea from that uh, you must look at the permissible things as well, not just the forbidden things? He gets it from the Talmud. In Tractate Yavamos, page 20a, is a famous rabbi who we simply call Rava. He lived in the late 3rd century and he is the one who said, sanctify yourself, not just by the forbidden things, but through the things which are permitted to you. Now, this idea of the permitted things can also be a problem for you. This idea is something that he actually didn't coin. In this phrase, he didn't coin it. Another rabbi 
coined this phrase. A rabbi from the first century, he was a disciple of another famous rabbi called Gamliel, and his name was Shaul. Paul, the Apostle Paul, actually coined this phrase before they even coined it. Paul uses this exact language twice in his letter to the Corinthians. Even in the book of Romans, he uses it as well. So he's writing to the Corinthians, out of all people, of course, because we know the Corinthians were playing in the Corinthian, right? they got their own issues. And he writes a letter to them because they were struggling with the laws of this week's parasha. They were struggling with Kedoshim, being holy and being set apart, and what it means to be holy. We mentioned all the laws about who you're allowed to marry. So Paul addresses them and says, I heard there's someone in your congregation who's living with his mother-in-law, stepmother, he says. Those are the very things that this week's parasha actually forbids. So they write him a letter, and they say to Paul, we've had an argument here amongst our congregation, because we are actually permitted to do certain things. Some say we shouldn't do it, but according to the Torah, these things are permitted for us. They might be gross things, but they are permitted. And Paul has to answer them on that very basis. Because let's be honest, if you look at the commandments, there are less prohibitions that apply to Gentiles. So the Corinthians were saying, you know what, that commandment doesn't apply to me anyway, so I'm actually allowed to do these things because I'm a Gentile. Now, there's an issue with that, because let's listen to how Paul responds to that type of thinking, to the type of person that says, you know what, it doesn't apply to me, so actually I can do it if I want to. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 14. It says the following, don't you know that unrighteous people will have no share in the kingdom of God? Don't delude yourselves, he says, people who engage in intercourse before marriage, people who worship idols, people who engage in intercourse after marriage with someone other than their spouse, People who engage in active or passive homosexuality, who steal, who are greedy, who get drunk, who assail people with contemptuous language, who rob, all of the stuff that we're forbidden to do in this week's parasha, none of them will share in the kingdom of God. Some of you used to do these things, but you have cleansed yourselves. You have been set apart for God. He's saying you stop doing those things, and now you've been set apart. That is the word kadosh, kiroshim. You've been set apart for God. You have come to be counted righteous through the power of the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, and the Spirit of our God. Now, you would go and say, but for me, everything is permitted. Right? What does Paul say? Maybe, but not everything is helpful. You might say, for me, everything is permitted. Well, maybe. But as far as I am concerned, I am not going to let anything gain control over me. He says, don't let your evil inclination have even a chance of taking over you. Sure, okay, fine, maybe it is permitted to you because of X, Y, Z. But that doesn't mean you should be doing it. It's not good for you. You may say, food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. Well, maybe, says Paul. But God will put an end to both of them, the food and your stomach. Anyhow, the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. God raised up the Lord, and he will raise up too by his power. Okay, so that's the first instance where Paul does this, and he uses that language. He says it again in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. This time in regard to food again. They were just moaned here about food. So they were saying, you know what, we're Gentiles. We have a few more loopholes with what we're allowed to eat, so we're going to eat all sorts of filthy things, because technically we're allowed to do it. Paul says... Just because it's permitted doesn't mean it's good for you. Here's uh, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23. You may say, uh, everything is permitted, you say. Well, maybe, but not everything is helpful. Everything is permitted? Maybe, but not everything is edifying. No one should be looking out for his own interests, but for those of his fellow. Remember what we said earlier. It matters how you appear to others. You shall not put a stumbling block before the blind. It matters how you look to your fellows. He says here, verse 25, Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth and everything in it belong to the Lord. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put in front of you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you this meat was offered as a sacrifice to an idol, then don't eat it out of consideration for the person who pointed it out and also for conscience sake. However, I don't mean your conscience, but that of the other person. Once again, don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind. If they've got issues, don't you become a stumbling block towards them. You might say, why should my freedom be determined by someone else's conscience? 
If I participate with thankfulness, why am I criticized over something for which I myself do bless God? Well, whatever you do, whether it's eating or drinking or anything else, do it also as to bring glory to God. Do not be a stumbling block to anyone. Paul is quoting this week's parasha. Do not be a stumbling block to anyone. Not to the Jews, not to the Gentiles, and not to God's messianic community. So this was an issue about who was allowed to eat with who in the communities with a mix between Jews and Gentiles. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not looking out for my own interest, but for those of the many, so that they may be saved. So what Paul is saying here is that just because something is technically allowed for you, doesn't make it good for you. For example, kosher food. Is kosher food good for you? Is it healthy? Depends. Depends. 100%. It depends how much of it you eat. I mean, look at the oily stuff we eat on Hanukkah. That's horrible for you. I mean, every time you guys come here for a festival, you have to first phone your doctor and get permission, right? Not only that. What do we use? We're not allowed to mix milk and meat, so what do we have instead of butter with our bread? Margarine and schmaltz. We fill our bodies with plastic in order to keep the commandments. Is it healthy for you? No, it's not, right? Uh, what else do we do? Cholent on a weekly basis. We've been, you know, providing uh, blood clots in our arteries since we came out of Egypt. Every single Sabbath. So yes, there is a minimum requirement for all of us. There's laws and how they apply to all of us. But to be holy, to be kadosh, we need to sanctify even the things that are permitted and allowed unto us. There we need to be careful. Because there's not only physical benefits or not physical benefits, there are also spiritual benefits in all these things that we do. Example with food. Regarding food, at the end of this week's parasha, it tells us that we are forbidden to eat of the impure animals. No pork, no rats, no snakes, none of that stuff, or any of the weird birds. But the way that the Torah communicates that to us is it says, don't let your soul be defiled. It uses the word naf shochesim, your nefesh. Now, usually when you learn about pure and impure, it's to do with physical things, right? At the end of the day, you can just go through a mikvah and tomorrow you're pure again. This is telling us that the things we do in this world also have a spiritual effect on us as well. They leave a mark on your soul. So that raises the question. And let's look at these Corinthians who are arguing, saying, listen, we're allowed to eat all these unkosher things that are unkosher for a Jew. Because the Torah says, you know, in Genesis, after Noah came out of the, uh, the flood, it says, everything you can eat, everything's allowed for the sons of Noah. So what if a Gentile eats an animal that is technically permissible to you? We're allowed to eat the pork. Does that have an effect on your soul as well? Because the animal still remains impure. And I believe it does. Here's the instruction that our apostles made for the Gentiles coming to faith. In chapter 6 of the Didache, it says the following. If you can bear the whole yoke of the Lord, if you can do all 613 commandments, it says here, then you will be complete. But if you can't do all 613, do as much as you can. Concerning food, it says... Bear what you can. It doesn't say eat bears. It says bear <laughs> what you can. Apparently that's been in the media this week. Bear what you can, but scrupulously guard yourself from what has been offered to idols. Remember that was one of the commandments in Acts 15. Because it is the worship of dead gods. So this is a principle to go by. Bear what you can. But should you keep only the minimum? No, we're trying to sanctify yourself through that which is permitted. So even look at the things that are permitted to you and make sure that through that you're also sanctifying yourselves. So when it comes to these unkosher things which technically are allowed for a Gentile, stay away from them if you want a reward. Listen to this. For the Midrash Rabbah, Ecclesiastes Rabbah 128, it says the following. The rabbis say, in the future era, the Holy One, blessed is he, will issue a, pro a pro uh, proclamation announcing as follows. He will say, let anyone who has never in his lifetime partaken of the flesh of swine come and receive his reward. Thereupon, many from among the nations, the Gentiles of the world, who had never in their lifetimes partaken of the flesh of a swine will come to receive their reward. There's a reward 
for going kosher as a Gentile, even if it's not a strict mitzvah that you have to be completely kosher like that. Here's a footnote. I want to read this to you. It says, God will clarify his previous statement, saying that the reward from refraining from eating flesh of swine is only for one who did so in observing his commandment. This would include the non-Jew who abstained from flesh of a swine because it is prohibited by the Torah, even though it was prohibited only to the Jews, for he would receive the reward as one who kept the mitzvah in which he was not even obligated. You still receive the reward for keeping the mitzvah, even if you aren't obligated. Powerful, eh? So why are you guys missing out on your double bacon-wrapped shrimp cheeseburgers? If it's technically permitted? Because you are sanctifying yourselves through that which is permitted. And that is the definition of kedoshim. That is the definition of holiness. You are making yourself holy by doing that. Another definition is the word chassid. A chassid is someone who goes beyond the letter of the law. Beyond just the requirements. And he does even more to be closer to his father in heaven. That is what Paul spoke about. That's what the Rambam talks about. It's more than just the letter of the law. You are now also keeping the spirit of the law. And that's the Torah Yeshua came to teach us. So... This concept applies across the board to all of the commandments and to everyone, whether Jew or Gentile, whether a free person or slave, whether male or female, whether you're the Kohen Gadol, whether you're a normal Kohen, whether you're a Levite, whether you're a regular Israelite, or whether you are a sojourner or a foreigner among Israel. This concept applies to all of us. Those things that are permitted to you, whatever is permitted to you, make sure you sanctify yourself, not just by avoiding the negative, but also by watching how you treat the positive things. You take it a bit, you've got to take it a step further because that is what being kadosh is all about. Being careful even with the things that are permitted. There's a famous Yiddish saying, Yiddish saying that translates as, that which is forbidden is forbidden, but that which is permitted isn't always necessary. So by doing that, we will also be keeping the spirit of the Lord. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom.